Chapter Two of Bob's A Girl Detective. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bob's A Girl Detective by Grace May North. Chapter Two A Proposal. Soon after daybreak the next morning, down a deserted country road, two thoroughbred horses were galloping neck and neck. "'Gee along, Star!' Bobs was shouting. She had lost her hat a mile back, and her short hair, which would ripple, though she tried hard to brush out the natural curls, was tossed about her head, making her look more hoidenish than ever. Dick, on his slender brown horse, gradually won a lead, and was a length ahead when they reached the Twin Oaks, which, for many years, had been their trysting place. Roberta and Dick had been playmates and then pals, squabbling and making up ever since the pinafore days, more, however, like two boys than a boy and a girl. Bobs, in fact, never thought of herself as a young person who, in due time, would become a marriageable young lady, and so it was with rather a shock of surprise that she heard Dick say, when they had drawn their horses to a standstill in the shade of a wide-spreading trees, "'I say, Roberta, couldn't you cut out this going-to-work stuff and marry me?' "'He gods and little fishes. Me marry you?' Bob's remark and the accompanying expression in her round, sunburnt face with its pertly tilting, freckled nose were none too complimentary. Dick flushed. "'Well, I say, what's the matter with me, anyhow? Anyone might think, by the way you're staring, that I'd said something dreadful. I'm not deformed, am I? And I've got money enough so you wouldn't have to work ever, and—' Roberta became a girl at once, a girl with a sincere nature and a tender heart. Reaching out a strong brown hand, she placed it kindly on the arm of her friend. Dicky boy, forgive me, if, if I was a little astonished and showed it. Truth is, for so many years I've thought of you as the playmate I could always count on to fight my battles, that I'd sort of forgotten that we were grown up enough to even think of marrying. Of course we aren't grown up enough, yet, to really marry, for you are only nineteen, and I'm worse than that, being not yet seventeen. And as for money, Dick, I'd like you heaps better if you were poor and working your way, but I know that you meant what you said most kindly. You wanted to save me from hard knocks, but Dick, honest Injun, I revel in them. That is, I suppose I will. Never having had one as yet, I can't speak from past experience. When they rode slowly back to find the hat that had blown off into the bushes, Dick rescued it, and when he returned it he handed her a spray of blossoming wild rose vine. The lad did not again refer to his offer, and the girl he noted with an inward sigh had evidently forgotten all about it. She was gazing about her appreciatively. "'Dicky boy!' she exclaimed. "'There's nothing much prettier than the early morning in the country is there, with the dew still sparkling and the meadow lark singing,' she added, for at that moment a joyous song arose from a nearby thicket. For a time they were silent as they rode slowly back by the way they had come. Then Dick said, "'Bobs, since you love the country so dearly, aren't you afraid you'll be homesick in that human whirlpool New York?' The girl turned towards him brightly. "'Perhaps, sometimes,' she replied. "'But it isn't far to the country when I feel the need of a deep breath of fresh air.' Then her face saddened as she continued, "'Of course we won't be coming out here any more.' She waved towards the vast estate, for which many years had been the home of the Vandergrifts. We couldn't stand it, not one of us could, to see strangers living where mother and father were so happy. They'll probably change things a lot. Then, she added most passionately, I hope they will. Then, if I ever do see it again, it will not look like the same place. Dick did not say what was in his heart, but gloomily he realised that if the girl at his side did not expect ever to return to that neighbourhood, it was quite evident that she would not be his wife, for his home adjoined that of the Vandergrifts. When he spoke, his words in no way betrayed his thoughts. "'Have you any idea, Bobs, what you'd like to do over there in the big city? I mean, to make a living?' The girl laughed, then sent a merry side glance toward her companion. "'You never could guess in a thousand years,' she flung at him, then challenged. "'Try!' The boy flicked his quirt at the drooping branches of a willow they were passing, then frankly confessed that he couldn't picture Roberta in any of the occupations for women of which he had ever heard. Mischievously, she queried, wouldn't I make a nice demure saleswoman for ladies' dresses, or— Great guns, no, was the explosive interruption. Don't put such a strain on my imagination. Then he laughed gaily, for he was evidently trying to picture the hoydenish girl mincing up and down in some fashionable emporium, dressed in the latest styles, while women peered at her through longettes. Bobs laughed with him when he told his thoughts, then said, I'll agree, as a model I won't do. 
Then, with pretended thoughtfulness, she flicked a fly from her horse's ear. Would I make a good actress, Dicky? do you think? You'd make a better circus performer, the boy told her. I'll never forget the antics we used to pull before. Before I realized that I was a girl and had to be ladylike, Bobs laughed with him, then added merrily. If it hadn't been for my prunes and prisons, Sister Gwendolyn, I might never have ceased to be a tomboy. I hope you will never become like Gwen, said Dick almost fiercely, or like my sister Phyllis either. They're not our kind, though I'm sorry to say it. Then, noting a far away, thoughtful expression which had crept into the girl's eyes, the lad inquired, Say, Bobs, have you any idea how Gwyn can earn a living? You're the sort who can hold your own anywhere. You'd be willing to work, but Gwyn, well, I can't picture her as a daily bread earner. His companion shook her head, then quite unexpectedly she said, Dick, why didn't you fall in love with Gwen? It would have solved her problem to have had someone nice and rich to take care of her. Well, of all the unheard preposterous suggestions, the amazed youth was so astonished that he unconsciously drew rein and stared at the girl. He knew by her merry laugh that she had said it but to tease, and so he rode on again at her side. Bobs feared that she had hurt her friend, for his face was still flushed and he did not speak. Reining her horse to be close to his, she again put a hand on his arm, saying with sincere earnestness, "'Forgive me, pal of mine, if I seem to speak lightly. Honestly, I didn't mean it. That is, not as it sounded. But I do wish that someone as nice, and yes, I'll say as rich as you are, would propose to Gwen. You don't know how sorry Gloria and I feel because Gwen has to be poor with the rest of us.' The boy placed his hand over the one resting on his arm, but only for a moment. "'You see,' Bobs explained, Glow and I honestly feel that an adventure of a new and interesting kind awaits us, and, as for little Lena May, money means nothing to her. If she can just be with Gloria, that is all she asks of fate. They had reached the Vandergriff gate, and Bob's drawing rein reached out her hand, saying, Goodbye, Dick. Then, after a hesitating moment, she added sincerely, I'm sorry, old pal. I wish I could have said yes. That is, if it means a lot to you. The boy held her hand in a firm clasp as he replied earnestly, I'm not going to give up hoping, Bobsy. I'll put that question on the table for a couple of years, but when I am twenty-one I'm going to hit the trail for wherever you are and ask it all over again. You see if I don't. You won't if Eloise Rochester has anything to do about it, was the girl's merry rejoiner. Then, as Bobs turned her horse towards the stables, she called over her shoulder, Oh, I say, Dick, I've got to tell you the profession I've chosen. I'm going to be a girl detective. End of chapter 2